all previous webinars are available on the SEA website if you want to catch up with them. Uh, but yeah, we're delighted to again have Ellie here and she's going to be discussing licensing. So I'll pass over to Ellie now and thank you all very much. Right, uh, thank you, Robert, for the introduction. Um, so Today we're going to look at licensing, so I'm going to start off by talking about licensing generally. Um, we'll look at, particularly at, uh, I want to focus on Creative Commons today, because there are all sorts of different types of licensing which are associated with copyright and heritage management. Um, so the focus of this particular session is on Creative Commons and the second part of, of the presentation, I shall look at a case study that I've been involved in working on from Shape Arts. So I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through. Now, as is usual with this, there will be an opportunity for questions at the end. Now, often what has happened so far in the last four talks or training sessions, um, the, often it's very difficult actually to give a, a right or wrong or an accurate answer within this forum. So what we've done previously is for me to, Robert, to give me your questions or the ones that I can't answer, or we can't answer immediately or might be a little more complex or need a little bit more thinking about because copyright is not, as we know, black and white. So um, if, as I said, I'll, um, there will be an opportunity for asking questions, but I shall also, um, uh, if people have uh, more complex questions, then I shall contact them um, within the next uh, couple of weeks or so. Okay, right. So let me share my screen then. Right, so the session today, as I said, this is session five, um, and this is uh, copyright and licensing. <clears throat> right, so part one then, I just want to talk about copyright and the licensing and how the two kind of come together. I'll be focusing in the first part of the talk, particularly on working with freelancers and suppliers and also with volunteers as well, because there is a lot that we need to think about in terms of these individuals when we're working in the archive sector and generally within heritage organisations. So starting off then with an overview, managing freelancers and suppliers. So at the end of the day, it is essential for organisations to undertake robust copyright management and also to build relationships with freelancers and suppliers. So these will be almost certainly, I'm sure many of your organisations have worked with professional photographers, filmmakers, even artists, and also designers as well, web designers as well. Perhaps you also have uh, somebody who is uh, looking after your social media, perhaps who doesn't work directly for the organisation. Now, in terms of copyright management, we need to think very carefully about how the work that they produce is actually managed. Because at the end of the day, only the copyright holders of a piece of work, of a photograph, of a film, of a web design, for instance, of a piece of artwork, of a painting, only they can copy or perform um, or show or adapt or even license these works. So it's very important to think about this very, very carefully. And Unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately for the freelancers and suppliers, the external individuals with whom you will be working, almost certainly, freelancers and suppliers automatically own 
their own copyright and related rights, of course, to the content they create whilst working for heritage organisations, for archives, for other organisations as well. Now, this is often where organisations run into issues, essentially, with managing copyright and also managing the relationship between themselves and between the freelancers who work for them or the consultants, perhaps. Um, Organisations must therefore manage these freelancers or consultants um, and the copyright accordingly and in a practical manner. And we should also remember that heritage organisations must also manage volunteers in the same way, because volunteers have the same status as freelancers, consultants or suppliers in terms of owning the copyright in a work that they produce. And this is going to something that a lot of heritage organisations and archives are just really becoming, starting to get to grips with the fact that volunteers actually own the copyright in the work. Um, I'll talk about that, how you can get around that in just a moment and solutions. Just a, uh, as an aside, under UK law, copyright content produced by contracted staff actually belongs to the company or the organisation. So there is no issue when you're talking about your regular staff. So again, managing freelancer suppliers agreements are a key solution then. Um, so essentially any copyright procedures and agreements should really be established before any external works are commissioned from freelancers and consultants and suppliers. So um, photographers, for example, taking photographs of an event, external photographers, of course, and perhaps even before an individual or perhaps an external team, in fact, is appointed to the role or, or to the consultant or consultant's role. So written agreement is essential a written agreement is essential in these situations if the organisation is looking to reuse essentially their content, if they want to use in house or on their website, the photographic material, the films, for instance. And the written agreement should ideally include a clause about the transfer of copyright from the supplier or the consultant or the freelancer to the organisation, if at all possible. Now, clearly, many suppliers are not keen, in fact, as you can imagine, on actually transferring their copyright. If this is possible, then this should be undertaken. And um, we'll talk about some other ways, licensing, for instance, in which these can actually be managed. Organisations, archives should also consider the creator's moral rights as well as the copyright as well. And this includes the right of paternity, which is the right to be properly identified as the author of the work, and also the right of integrity, which is the right to not have the work subjected to derogatory treatment. So these should also ideally be included within any written agreement between organisation and external consultant or freelancer. Freelancers can also waive, opt to waive the moral rights, in fact, or indicate a preference for crediting their material um, and or for the consultation when the content is changed by the organisation. I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through. And volunteer agreements should also include clause on the transferring of copyright to the heritage organisation. Otherwise, we as archives are in the situation where essentially these um, vol the volunteers own the copyright to the work rather than the organisation. So this should be thought about in great detail. So essentially, uh, we have this process, which is called licensing in. We also have licensing out. I'll talk about those just in just a moment. They're often treated separately, but actually licensing in licensing out aren't actually that, that different. And often they are managed um, by organizations in one go, if you like. 
So this idea of licensing in, this idea that is that you license content in. We can do this and licensing in the content from freelancers, suppliers and consultants. This is one option for heritage organisations if they want to use content, particularly if the freelancer doesn't want to transfer the copyright on their photographs or videos or, or whatever they are working with. Um, artworks, paintings, etc. So licensing is another option there. Um, there are all sorts of different types of licenses, and I don't want to, we haven't got time to go into detail in these top into these types of licenses at the moment. We're really just kind of touching the surface in terms of licensing. Um, but really the use of the content essentially will determine the types of permissions that are sought from the freelancers or consultants or suppliers. Um, copyright assignment licenses for use with suppliers include an exclusive license. And again, I'm not going to go into detail these, an exclusive license where no person or organization other than the named licensee can exploit the intellectual property rights. We also have a sole license where one third party and also the original creator, so the photographer, the filmmaker, for example, retains the right to use the intellectual property. And we also have a non exclusive license where the licensee has the right to use the intellectual property, but the licensors are free to exploit the same intellectual property. So as you can see, this is uh, becoming, <laughs> starting to become relatively complex already. Um, just to be aware that many of these licenses, not all, but many can actually be restricted to a particular country, a jurisdiction or region, and also a time as well. So what I mean by that is that licenses, these types of licenses, licensing in, for instance, and other types of licenses, they, do not have to be perpetual. So they, they don't have to be forever. In fact, they can be for one year, two years, etc. And then and then the, the licensing will be re-agreed or not re-agreed at the end of it. And just to be aware that if your organisation is working, I mean, this is often more perhaps for the museum sector rather than the art archive sector, but we do in the archive sector work with artists as well from time to time. And just be aware that many organisations actually deal slightly differently with artists. So external artists, freelancers, consultants, suppliers, etc. Um, so um, these art commissions, for example, these are often managed differently. Paintings, installations, sculptures, for example. And one example might be, of course, when you are loaning in artworks for a temporary exhibition. So these are, as I said, you know, clearly kind of paintings, as we can see here on the right hand side, rather than specifically kind of archive material. So these are paintings, probably relatively modern paintings where the artist is still living, in fact. Now, it's very often the case that artists are most unwilling to transfer the copyright in the artworks and paintings, as you can imagine, essentially, they are often less willing than photographers or filmmakers. Oops, sorry, I need to go back again. As you, as you might imagine, they don't want to, you know, this is a, a, an artwork which is going temporarily into a, an art gallery or perhaps an archive space. So that it's only going in temporarily, not as a part of the collection. So for them, there is no benefit essentially in assigning the copyright. And because of this, licensing is therefore mu a much more realistic option. So this is an option that, that many organizations will look at, the licensing of the work so that copies can be made often for the duration of the exhibition or perhaps for an additional year afterwards, perhaps when the exhibition is uh, traveling around the country. 
Also, this is also the case, the waiver of moral rights may not be appropriate, in fact, when working with artists and exhibitions. And again, you know, these are artworks owned by the artists, they're not selling them, and they're not giving them up. So it might be, again, that, that, that they, they are not keen on waiving their moral rights at the end of the day. As an alternative, organisations may opt to either credit the artist or perhaps you know, when the work is displayed and to seek their permission when adapting the image of, or, of the artwork or the uh, painting. That's one option. Right, so that was a brief overview of um, copyright and licensing and where they come together. So I just want to move on now and have a look at creative commons licensing. We've had a very brief overview, look at how licenses actually work. We've had a look at this idea of licensing in from suppliers. So now I want to have a look at the Creative Commons license. So Creative Commons is essentially just one type of license. And so the Creative Commons essentially was set up about 20 years ago as a US not-for-profit organization and it creates free international and also public licenses essentially. So Creative Commons is one of several public copyright licenses that allows for the distribution and public use of copyrighted work under copyright law. And most of the content, in fact, as you might imagine in the 21st century, in the 2020s is actually web-based, it's digital content, in fact. And there is, is a, a website, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, but it, the website is excellent. In fact, it is, it is great and you can, everybody can use it themselves. People can use it for their own content. You can use it as part of an organization as well to license your material. So Creative Commons is essentially an international suite of license templates. And there are over 1 billion items currently online licensed under Creative Commons or CC which is a vast amount. And there is a, an excellent searchable online database of content that we can all use, in fact, to see what type of material is, is out there. So we can use it as a, as a kind of end user or a reuser of content, if you like, essentially. So the Creative Commons website is absolutely excellent. It's very, very clear, very, very easy to use. So the aim with Creative Commons licensing then is to simplify the granting of copyright permissions for published or mainly web material and to ensure that users or end users can actually locate content faster or content that they are looking to reuse or adapt or change perhaps. So the license is used when an author, so the author of the work, the creator of the work, wants to provide the public, the public in general, with the right to share and use and reproduce and develop and even adapt their work. So the creative Commons license, as you'll see, if you go to the website, is actually granted by the copyright holder. So the individual, um, so for example, if you are a photographer, a freelance photographer, perhaps, or a filmmaker, for instance, or a musician, you would um, essentially, you are the individual responsible for the copyright holder, in fact. So you essentially um, grant the permission through Creative Commons for public to actually use your work. This needs to be done, we have to remember, with permission from other rights holders as well, who might be 
um, essentially might actually be an additional copyright holder within your work. So it's just to be careful if you're, for example, you know, if, if it's a film, for example, you've got lots of different types of copyright in, um, you know, soundtracks, for instance, different types of copyright. There are usually more than one type of copyright in your work. So you need to be very careful if you're going to use Creative Commons for yourself or for your organisation that you have actually the copyright, you are the copyright holder or you have permission from the copyright holder, essentially. So the create, Creative Commons or CC can be used for all works which fall under copyright law. So these are the works that we'd be looking at and these include literary, dramatic, musical, artistic works, films, sound recordings, broadcasts, etc, etc. So the CC licenses are very easy to use. The website, as I said before, it's very easy to, to use, it's very approachable. And you as an individual or as your organisation, you can actually select predefined conditions of reuse of those particular images or film content or artworks or sound tracks or music tracks, sound recordings, etc. And the public can actually re, in most cases, can actually reuse the licensed work. So the works that you, re, you, you are actually licensing through Creative Commons, the public can actually reuse these works as long as they are in copyright. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail about Creative Commons because again, you know, it, it's a very, um, it's a very kind of deep and layered once you start to look into it, there's a lot to think about. But essentially these licenses have three layers of design. They have a traditional legal tool, a kind of legal code layer. They have a commons deed, which is a human readable version of the license. And they also have a machine readable version of the license, which means that the web, uh, the internet knows when the work is actually available under creative Commons. So it's more than just licensing. It's, it's there's a lot of kind of technology actually involved in this. And you, if you are licensing your content to, to be used by the public, you can actually use the CC tools, which are available again through the website to help share work, for example, through embedding information on your website using an HTML code associated with the license. As I said, it, it does get, get quite technical if you, if you wish it to do so. So Creative Commons is frequently used for licensing out. So this is essentially this idea of licensing out is the, the licensing of the content that you have, your organization holds, and hopefully the content that you hold the copyright for, or you have a license from the creator, or you have an, a, a transfer of copyright from the original cre creator, a photographer, for example, or filmmaker, a freelancer or consultant, or being well. So the licensing act, in fact, is the you licensing your material, the material you have in-house, so that it can actually be used in the public domain to some extent in fact so as i said the licensing is undertaken by both individual creators and also by heritage organizations heritage organizations increasingly are using cc licenses and i'll talk about it why that is the case as we go along um, and Many heritage organisations use the licences that allow the reuse of content created by freelancers and suppliers, as I've already explained. And some heritage organisations will actually use image licensing. So actually the, the licensing of your images that you, have, that you are the owner of and you have the copyright permissions for. So image licensing platforms, for example, there is the Science and Society Picture Library run by the Science Museum Group. 
abridgment of images as well is another example of an image licensing platform. So this is one of the benefits essentially of using your content online, although not specifically uh, Creative Commons in that sense. And some organizations actually use the licensing act for brand licensing as well. So this is the use of your organizational logo in return for a profit or a fee. For example, I know the Science Museum, the Science Museum Group actually does that. They actually sell material with their uh, logo logos on, essentially. So um, as I mentioned before, if organizations are look at looking at licensing out, particularly with Creative Commons, they must think about clearing any third party copyright within the content before it is reused or licensed out. So this is the, as I explained before, this is the content where this is a, a an image that you might have in your collection, which was taken by a photographer who hasn't transferred the copyright. So you need to go back to the photographer and to have a discussion about whether this is a possibility or if not, whether they would like to license it, in fact, so that it can be used through licensing act. That's very, very complex undertaking, but these are some of the possibilities you have with your collection. Um, it's really important as well that freelancers and consultants and suppliers working for your organization flag up to you as an organization any third party rights in the works that they are actually producing for you. Um, and again, ensure if possible that the copyright is actually transferred to them and then ideally to you as an organization or certainly licensed in to you. So as with tracing copyright holders, um, you know, undertaking research for orphan works, for example, rights, this type of rights clearance. So the rights clearance that you perhaps need to do with, you, with your freelancers or um, with other uh, copyright holders, essentially this should be um, assigned to specific teams within your organization and the rights research documented and also budgeted for and also permission letters created so this is going back to you know, when we did the session on orphan works for example and we also need to be careful that actually data protection the data protection element of this licensing in or at least licensing act is managed appropriately because some licensing schemes don't really consider this so which is therefore a drawback of some schemes in fact but we need to make sure that we are not for example licensing material which is a data protection risk uh, uh, for instance or with data subjects in photographs who haven't been um who you need to go go and seek their permission as well as the photographers and copyright holders too. Right, so I'll just quickly go through the different types of Creative Commons licenses. I think that, um, again, it's very, it becomes incredibly complex, but it's quite useful to know what the different types are. And also uh, the fact that there are in fact seven main license types. Uh, some will say, in fact, the Creative just be aware that Creative Commons website says that there are six and then it has the first one I've got here, the CC0 as an additional one. So I've said seven license types because it's I find it easier to think of it in that way. And I know that, for example, Naomi Korn, um, some of the work and publications that, that, um, that she has produced, she has also specified that, that it is seven. So just be aware that Sometimes it, it's it's six and sometimes it's seven, but ostensibly they are the same. So in 2013, we saw the release of the current 4.0 CC license. And in fact, as I said, there are seven main license types and just be aware as well that organizations or individuals, in fact, who are 
undertaking these uh, this licensing can also mix the licenses up now that's where it starts to get very complicated and very tricky essentially so i'll just go through i don't want to go through absolutely every detail here i'll just put uh, some bullet points so that we get really an idea about what these licenses are about the different types of licenses we've got this the cc0 the most flexible license which allows creators of the work so your photographer your filmmaker for instance your artist your musician to relinquish the copyright and actually put their works into the worldwide public domain without restriction in fact so this means that reusers of the content so these are kind of end users but we call them reusers because they often use the content for something else so the term here is reuser the reuser of content can actually alter or distribute or remix or adapt or even build upon the material in fact there are no conditions attached to this and they can also undertake this for commercial purposes as well we have um, attribution as well number two where reusers can distribute and remix and adapt and build upon material in any medium or format, providing that the author must be acknowledged. And this can also be used for commercial purposes as well. So that's the uh, usually actually the title, which appears confusing to start with, but attribution just refers essentially to the fact that the author must be acknowledged. So with these different types, it looks like a complicated title, but actually it's fairly straightforward once you start to break it down. Like the, the three, the attribution share alike. So again, re-users can undertake these activities once again. However, the any adaptations must be shared under identical terms. Um, and the again with the attribution we have the credit the credit for the creator must be given this is the attribution of course and this can also be used for commercial purposes too this is usually what um very often what wikipedia uses in fact wikipedia of course is a is a key user of creative commons which is why wikipedia is excellent for us as you know, if, we, if we're looking to put together, for example, a, um, a talk on uh, something external, not to do with the collection, then Wikipedia is often the first port of call because it often has these, these Creative Commons licensed images that we can use in, in many different um, uh, situations, if you like. Um, we have number four, attribution, no derivatives. Um, so again, reusers can copy, distribute, etc. But no derivatives or, or adaptations of the work are permitted. Um, again, the creator must be credited here. It can also be used for commercial purposes. And five, attribution non-commercial. Um, fairly obvious. Then again, the reusers can distribute, remix, adapt etc but this is also this is only for non-commercial works in fact and the new works created must acknowledge the rights holders and the again the creator must be credited number six is the attribution non-commercial share alike which again sounds very very complex but again it's the same essentially but in this particular case, any reusers using the content, in fact, the new creations, whatever they create with your content, must be licensed under identical terms. And this is, again, non-commercial uses of the work only, and the creator must be credited. And then the seventh type, the attribution non-commercial, no derivatives. Again, a real mouthful there, but fairly straightforward does what it says no derivatives or adaptations of the work permitted uh, non-commercial uses of the work and you must credit the creator so essentially um you know it's a case of looking at these different licenses and again on the website 
they are on the Creative Commons official website. They are very, very easy to, to do. In fact, they basically take you through a process of, of tick boxes, essentially. Do you want this? Do you want that? And it essentially does it for you and comes up with a recommended license for you. So it's really worth going to have a look at it because it breaks it down in, in a way and makes it very, very simple for us to use. Um, there are risks, of course, associated with using the Creative Commons licenses. Now, I know an issue that a lot of organisations are dealing with or thinking about at the moment that a lot of archives, for instance, which have a lot of National Lottery Heritage Fund funding, for example, there are issues associated sometimes with funding bodies. So the National Lottery Heritage Fund, the now the default licence is CCBY. This is an issue because it could potentially be unpopular with a rights holder. So as I'll talk about in the second part of the talk, previously they had a different licensing default, which meant that there was a, a lot more flexibility. But here there are kind of questions over whether heritage organisations will actually be able to, um, to actually, you know, get the, or obtain the, permissions, in fact, from the creators, the copyright holders, the photographers, the filmmakers, the authors of the letters in your collection. Um, there's also a risk that you infringe the creator's moral rights with Creative Commons licenses, because there's no way, essentially, of, of ensuring that the content is not used in a kind of derogatory manner. So this is a, a, a risk with moral rights. In fact, there's also a risk of the content being used for promotional purposes. So for example, for promoting your uh, people, other people's views or ideas or viewpoints that perhaps you're not 100% in agreement with. So it's very, very difficult to monitor, impossible to monitor essentially what individuals are actually using your work for. And there's also a risk when the Creative Commons rights are not cleared adequately because the content reusers could actually, can actually be held responsible for any copyright infringements that do occur. So it's, therefore, it's very, very important that if you are opt to undertake Creative Commons licensing, that you make sure that every single right has been cleared properly or licensed in properly. The other risk or issue, potential issue, uh, perhaps for some of us anyway, is that Creative Commons licenses cannot be revoked. So this may be seen as an issue for uh, a heritage organisation or perhaps an organisation that is licensed in content from a external supplier, photographers, for instance. So this is, so it, it, this is actually, it's actually a perpetual license. So even if the individual organization actually stopped distributing the content, the licenses are still perpetual in fact. So this may be uh, seen as an issue for, for many heritage organizations or archives, in fact. And again, another potential risk, in fact, is that you cannot limit the Creative Commons use to specific countries, even if the ported license is used to specify uh, jurisdiction. So the ported license is essentially when you are, you are um, adapting copyright law into your own country, essentially. So it's in it's international, I suppose that's that's what I'm trying to say there, which may also have its risks, essentially. And as I referred to before, it is highly complex. It's a highly complex licensing scheme when you're mixing together some occasionally, you know, seven or seven of the CC licenses and an element from each one of them. So I suppose, you know, really the advice there is to keep it as simple as possible in terms of the different types of licensing options that, that you're going to use. Right.
Right, so that's an overview essentially of copyright and how it really impacts upon uh, licensing, in particularly in archives, the archive sector and in heritage organisations as well. So for the second part of the talk, I want to go on and have a look at a case study from an a organization I am currently working with and that is uh, Shape Art. So I'll start off by explaining a little bit about what Shape Art is. We have the website there. Uh, essentially uh, um, these slides will be shared at the end so obviously all these links and hyperlinks you can have access uh, to through me sh sharing the presentation. So shape arts then um so let me talk a little bit about shape arts before we have a look at how they've handled licensing in fact in recent years so shape arts is a disability-led arts organization that works to improve access to culture for disabled people this is through providing opportunities for disabled artists training cultural institutions to be more open to disabled people and running participatory arts and development programs. Shape Arts also provides auditing and training services and delivers consultancy in the UK and overseas. And some of the programs that it is running at the moment or has run in the past, and I shall talk about a couple of those in just a second. These include Shape Open, the Adam Reynolds Award, Shape Collection, and DACA, which is an archives project I'll talk about in a moment, Unlimited, and also Endemac, which is the brand new archives program. All Shapes work is informed by the social model of disability. So this essentially is a, the idea that actually it's, um, you know, it's not uh, disabled people who, who have, have the issues, it's the environment around them that needs to in, adapt itself in whatever ways, socially or perhaps physically, um, to ensure that they are able to uh, live and work freely. Shape's philosophy, the founding principle of shape is that all disabled people should have the opportunity to participate fully in arts and culture and the vision is an aspiring and inclusive art sector accessible to all shapes mission is to promote great art and inclusive practices knowledge and learning ensuring that disabled people have active and influential roles in arts and culture as leaders artists participants audiences and also, most importantly, as part of a skilled workforce. And SHAPE's values include inclusion, ambition, creativity, and also excellence. Right, so what I want to focus on here is the recent NDACA project. We've got the link up at the top there. I know it's not quite um, visible, but you can. Google in DACA in the meantime, and it will take you through to the standalone website. Fact. So NDACA stands for the National Disability Art Collection and Archive, and you can see the website here is a screenshot, in fact, of the web website. So I just want to talk a little bit then about the NDACA project. So, INDACA was a £1 million project, the aim to bring to life the history and heritage of the UK disability arts movement. The project itself was funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund, the Arts Council England and the Joseph Rowntree Foundation. And essentially what it does is it is the project, the INDACA project is actually documenting the disability arts movement which began in the late 1970s and which still continues to this day and the disability arts movement involved and still does involve disabled people and their allies who broke down barriers and helped in fact to change law 
with the Disability Discrimination Act, which came about in 1995. The disability arts movement is and was recorded by artists, photographers and filmmakers in the main part. And the Indaka online catalogue consists of about 3,500 3, images, including photographs, artworks, letters, films, and also ephemera relating to the documenting the golden age of the disability arts movement. There's also oral history films, learning resources, content about emerging disabled artists, biographies of contributors to the disability arts movement. There is also, as part of the project, and DACA set up a research facility at Buckinghamshire New University, which includes the Indaka Learning Wing and the Physical Archive Repository for the material that it collected. A lot of this was obviously kind of, you know, three-dimensional paintings, for, for instance, but also film content and photographic material. So just to show you here, just some examples from the Endaka project. This is a poster, as you can see here on the right hand side with the slogan, Shape London Makes Art Happen. And what we have there in the centre is a photograph image of the woman creating pottery and watched by the artist Adam Reynolds, as you can see there. So this is just an example of the content that we have as part of the collection. Some of the other key items in the collection, this is a colour photograph in fact here of a portrait painting of the artist Steve Acrib resting on a bench outside. The, this is the portrait painting itself resting on a bench outside. This is based on a photograph of Steve Acrib taken in Kew Gardens in London in fact. And we also have here the oil painting of Baroness Jane Campbell. She, in fact, is and was an active crossbench peer in the House of Lords, and she was heavily involved in the passing of the Disability Discrimination Act in 1995. So, as you can see, there's a whole range of different types of media um, and items, in fact, that, that are form part of the Endaka collection here, for example, is a photograph showing the block telethon protests outside the, the LWT building on London's South Bank. So there are many, many hundreds of photographs which um, essentially document protests, also film footage as well. And also the three-dimensional objects here, for example, this is a t-shirt with the slogan, free our people adapt. So adapt are in fact a US based disability rights organization that inspired many of the UK grassroots organizations. We also have other materials such as the white badge that we see here, for example, with the slogan, we demand rights, not charity. So as you can see, there's a whole range of different types of material as part of the Indaka collection. So let me talk a little bit then before we finish about how Indaka has actually managed the rights, uh, intellectual property rights, so relating to copyright, of course, the strategy and the approaches that they have actually taken with their material. So the, I am indebted, I have to say, to, uh, to both David Healy, the project director and director of SHAPE as well, and also Alex Cowan, who is the archivist. I'm a, the consultant archivist on the project with, for SHAPE. I'll talk about that a little bit more in just a moment, but they have, uh, they have actually um, given me a lot of, provided me with a lot of information, in fact, about this particular project that they were leading in fact. So, and DACA actually sought advice from lawyers on external lawyers on managing copyright right at the beginning because they were very, very keen 
to actually get this right. Now, obviously with external funding, they were able to kind of budget this before they actually put in for the funding from the National Lottery Heritage Fund. So they did have budget for actually doing this. So um, some of the, the images on their website and on the online catalog um, and the archival material deposited was actually deposited by CCBYNC, Creative Commons Non-Commercial Basis. This was a previous requirement of the National Lottery Heritage Fund when this project was actually undertaken. Um, this is kind of three or four years ago, I suppose now. It has, of course, recently changed. So um, there, so NDAC is feeling essentially was that this essentially the Indaka project was a non-commercial project and website so where possible Indaka avoided using copyright material where the owner was a professional creative a supplier or a consultant for example a photographer or a filmmaker or an artist in fact and they did this deliberately so as not to disrupt their commercial careers both David Heavey and Alex Cowan are um, filmmakers and photographers. So they, they were very, free and have had worked in a freelance capacity. So they were very, very aware essentially of how this needed to work properly and also fairly as well. So in fact, most or many of the works, in fact, in the Indaka collection on the website, they are, mostly or mainly the copyright of the, actually of the creator rather than the organization rather than a DACA or shape arts itself that was deliberately done in that way that's not to say that they are all like that um so the DACA does not allow for the reuse of material where the organization is not the copyright holder However, using the Creative Commons licensing meant that NDACA and also the end users or audiences, in fact, were free to use and reuse digitized images across locations and platforms to retell stories of the disability arts movement within context of profiling, exhibiting, publishing and promoting of NDACA. Um, also, of course, you know, we just we have to remember that for general use as well. Visitors may actually use images and stories of Ndaka in context of a fair dealing as well. So, i.e. for research purposes and non-commercial purposes as well. Um, this, of course, does not infringe copyright, provided it is accompanied by sufficient acknowledgement if it, this is, is at all possible. Images on the NDACA website, on the online catalogue, they have full credits, including the creator, where the creator is known, and also extensive catalogue entries alongside that. Now, of course, like with so many projects, NDACA also came across orphan work. So for some of the material that they have in the archive, in fact, the copyright holder is unknown. This is very common, as we have seen in previous sessions, of course. So NDACA essentially made a concerted effort to actually trace the copyright owners of the works that they copied. For example, the 3D objects in their collection that they wanted images of. They have some images of artworks that are not in their collection as well. So it's the image that's in their collection rather than the artwork. The artwork is still with the artist essentially. So they um, spent um, many months, in fact, attempting to trace the copyright owners of these types of work. And at this particular point where it's clear that they weren't going to be able to, they were not able to, to in fact, within, within the time allotted to trace the copyright owners. In fact, again, at this particular point, they resought legal advice and um, I made the decision to include images online where the copyright holders were unknown. Um, 
So in fact, where the creator information is unavailable, the image is ascribed to a depositor or source. So let me just say before I finish up, um, because we are ob obviously almost out of time. In fact, I, I will, will be, uh, I just need to uh, quickly uh, wrap up the orphan works uh, section. So Ndaka felt the original intention of the creator, so the artist, part of the disability arts movement, the filmmaker, the photographer, was such that they would wish their works to be seen as part of the disability arts movement. These are orphan works, of course, we don't know who the creators are, but this was the general Ndaka approach. And they wouldn't want material to be lost because of complex legal copyright restrictions. So the ultimate decision was that the creator was unlikely to object to the works being displayed on the website. Um, essentially. So like many organisations, NDACA has a takedown policy when copy, the copyright owner requests this, if the copyright owner comes forwards. And they will also make, they will correct titles to work, change descriptions, and also add credits if contacted by the copyright holder. This is fairly standard, of course, with these types of orphan works. And let me just finish off then just by talking very quickly, um, just for the, the last minute or so about a brand new project by Shape Arts. This is a follow up archive project known as Endermac, the National Disability Movement Archive Collection, also funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. This is currently at development stage. It was launched in 2020 with the aim of collecting heritage story of the UK disability movement. So separate in many respects to the previous project, which was much more about the arts movement. This is the UK disability movement. And the focus is, is more on kind of texts and documents, letters, correspondence, this kind of thing, to ensure that the history is preserved for those who were part of it and accessible and relevant to modern audiences. So currently um, we have Alex Cowan, the archivist, I myself as well as consultant archivist, I'm consultant on the digital side in fact, so we're collecting around 5,000 items, objects and articles and publications from key movement activists to help to deliver inclusion for disabled people over the last few decades. And we've already collected photographs, documents, diaries, videos, etc. in fact. And the shape is currently building teams and writing key policies to just support the delivery phase of this brand new project in 2022, next year in fact, um, prioritizing items for collection, designing a physical repository on site at Shape, shape Art, which is in Peckham Library, and also the delivery phase will include the purchase of a digital asset management system, a DAM system, and also the development of e-learning web pages as well. So a lot to think of um, over the next year in terms of essentially of kind of copyright, well, also data protection as well, but there's a lot to research and think about on this new project in terms of how copyright, how precisely copyright is going to be managed going forward with this new project. Right, so there are some um, copyright and licensing online resources there. Again, um, I will share these slides after the talk so you can actually have, if you're interested, then you can actually um, have a look at them in, in much more detail there. So, Thank you very much. Essentially, that's, uh, that's the end of the talk. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing. So, um, sorry, it's, uh, we haven't got a, a huge amount of time for, for questions. So, sorry, it's, uh, I meant to finish about five minutes earlier than that, but um, <laughs> Thank there's you so a lot much, to say. No, it certainly seems to be a tough, right? Every edition, it seems to get more and more complicated. Mm -hmm. So thank you. So if anybody does have any questions, please do pop them in the chat box just now. Uh, just, we have actually had one comment just about CC licenses and Crown copyright. 
um, that it is a, you need to, instead you need to use the open government license uh, rather than CC. Is there is it is the open government license as a rich variety as the CCs or is it slightly more straightforward? Do you know? Um, I think yeah. I think that the um, I mean there are. I think generally organisations go for the, they they very often will go for Creative Commons, I think, because there are uh, organisations and also individuals as well. I mean, I mean partly because it's, I think the, the option with the Creative Commons is, because it is well known about, it's well known about not just in the heritage sector, but also in the art sector generally, and also for other sectors as well. So it's kind of much more established, really, and it's it's been, you know, it's been on the cards for 20 years, it's international, and it's also it's also free. And that is a that is a key, a key thing for organizations, of course, for heritage organizations, for archives, essentially. Um, so yeah, so uh, sorry, I'm just I'm just looking at the um uh, just looking at the, at, at the chat there, at just making sure that I have actually answered the question. So, so yes, obviously the, that's a very good point that, you know, CC licenses can't be used for absolutely everything and you do need to kind of check whether you are, you know, whether your licenses can be, uh, whether they are actually um, permissible as it were. But I, But I think in general terms, the Creative Commons licensing is, is generally a lot wider and a lot more popular, essentially, from the point of view of organisations, essentially. Thank you. So. We've not had any other questions in, so I will wish everyone farewell and thank Ellie very much again for her series. Uh, they are all available on the website and I will also share the slides from this one with everyone too. If you do have any questions in the meantime please do just sort of email me and I, I can always field them on to Ellie as well. Yeah that's so, yeah. fine and um, very often it's it's better if if I, I have a bit more time to kind of you know to actually create a, a, a sensible written answer. <laughs> No, um, super. Very nope. often it's it's much easier rather than trying to squeeze it in in 30 seconds or whatever. <laughs> so. The one thing that I've learned from these last webinars is that there's nothing easy and straightforward about copyright. So yes, the more information, the better. But no, thank you very much again, Ellie. And yes, we will see you soon. Right. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.